everyone, and welcome to our webinar for today. Uh, we're going to be talking about AI tools like ChatGPT in higher education. Uh, my name is Shelby Lamar. I'm the Associate Director for the uh, Center for Academic and Faculty Excellence here at Claremont Graduate University. Um, I am being joined by Sarah, who is one of our fellows with the CAFE program. She is going to be my co-host. So if uh, you need any technical assistance or you would like to ask a question specifically, she will be watching the chat for me. Um, and I see a few more people entering the, um, uh, let's see, the waiting room. So, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, first off, I just want to start very briefly with uh, what are AI chatbots like ChatGPT? So very briefly, uh, it's an artificial intelligence chatbot. You might have seen other similar things um, in like, you know, if you're talking to your, um, <laughs> for instance, like phone provider and they have a chat with a representative option, that can oftentimes be a type of artificial intelligence chatbot. So what they are designed to do is respond to natural language prompts from the user, and it generates text, at least chatbots like ChatGPT, uh, based on its algorithms and the databases that it has been trained on. Uh, so that's very simply what uh, AI chatbots are. So um, a big question everyone wants to know is how does it work? So I'm not gonna be uh, pretend to be an expert on this, but I do know a little bit. So how it works is um, the AI program uses algorithms and uh, applies those to its massive database that it was trained on. And so some of the types of algorithms, I'll go over them real quick. Uh, I don't wanna bore everyone because it can be a, a little bit much, but uh, some of the algorithms um, include, um, uh, so deep learning algorithms such as neural networks. Um, this processes and analyzes large amount of tax, text data. Uh, reoccurrent neural networks, um, networks that process sequences of data, such as sentences or paragraphs, and it can maintain a memory of previous inputs that went through it. Um, con uh, let's see, uh, transformer models, uh, neural networks that use self uh, attention mechanisms to process sequences of data. Anyway, I, I'm not going to go into all of these kinds of algorithms, but basically there's a lot of different type of algorithms that go into these to uh, apply to this massive database or tr uh, training database. And um, one of the things about these AI chatbots is we don't actually know what the algorithms are, just like oftentimes with um, you know, social media, we don't know what the algorithms are that are feeding us our uh, news feeds, for instance. Um, but we do know some of the databases that it was using. So uh, specifically for ChatGPT, it was using the common crawl, which is a large uh, data set of web pages that's been archived since 2008, uh, and it is trained up to the 2001 um, uh, of this, right? And so it has a lot of web pages and uh, language data. It was also trained on Wikipedia, uh, the 2001 for, uh, 2021 version. Wow, I'm showing my age, 2021 version. Um, and so it doesn't go past that, at least the uh, non-pro version. Uh, it was also trained on news articles, books, um, and academic articles. Um, but we don't know exactly what that entailed uh, beyond this kind of uh, general understanding of what might be in the database. Uh, we know that a lot of um, things were excluded from the database to prevent um, some inappropriate answers and things like that from being generated. Uh, but anyone who has uh, used the database already does know that when you're working with any databases that are being pulled from the internet, it's going to include um, uh, bias, it's going to include uh, a lot of things that are inaccurate, and um, that's just something we need to be aware of, and uh, the creators are hoping to improve its accuracy as we move forward. So that's just a little bit about like what it is 
and how it works. But what I really want to get into, um, oh, and here is how you can access this version. Um, I'm going to pop it in the chat real quick if you're interested uh, about chat GPT in particular. Um, and uh, let me see, sorry, just popping this into the chat. There you go. So there's a free version and a pro version uh, with just $20 a month, which started at the start of this month. Um, and basically the, the plus version gives you priority access and newer features. All right, so what I really wanna talk about today are two things. What can you do with the AI and how can we integrate it into our classrooms? And some things that we need to think about as educators specifically. So first, um, just an overall, uh, kind of idea. It can create text, or I should say generate text. Um, it can generate ideas. It can do analysis, can provide templates, and it can work with coding and um, also uh, translation. So in a little bit more in detail. So if you put in, for instance, a uh, an article, an academic article, you can ask the chat bot to summarize the text for you and give you a brief summary. Um, if you enter in your own essay or brief writing and um, have it, it can alter the text. So if you say, here's my essay, um, can you change the tone? It can change the tone to an academic tone. It can be gloomy and pessimistic or an optimistic tone. So it can change the tone of your writing. It can change the audience. So it will change the text that you put in, and you can say, make this um, based or, or write, rewrite this based on a professional um, business audience or rewrite this based on a audience for video game players. Um, and it can uh, generate that based on the, you know, the, the language and the, um, uh, the most commonly used words of that, of those groups, right? It's also been trained on style. So it can, you can ask, please write this, uh, rewrite this essay in a way that um, is in the style of New York Times, uh, you know, or a blog post or a corporate memo. And it can do that as well. Um, maybe one of the most useful things it can do is actually improve grammar uh, and typos. So you can say, here's my essay, please um, correct my grammar and typos. So we can do that. Um, I have checked and you don't have to even spell everything correctly in your prompts. It can figure out when you've misspelled something in your prompt and still answer you. So um, it can also give feedback and suggestions on writing. So for instance, if you enter in your essay and say, um, I'm looking to improve this. Can you give me feedback? It can give you feedback on how to improve your essay. Instead of just rewriting it for you, it can give you suggestions um, and it can uh, give you tips and stuff on that particular piece of text that you're putting in. Uh, it can also translate into different languages. I don't have a list of all the languages it can translate into, um, but uh, I think it's pretty extensive. So that's how it can change a text. Um, but let's talk about also generating text. So not only can it uh, interact with a piece of text and, and change it, it can also generate, I don't wanna say new because honestly, it's only working off the database it has, right? But it can create new combinations of things. Um, so uh, it can, you can ask it to create um, a story, poem, it can write a, uh, a script for a TV show or a podcast. It can create lesson plans. So you can say, please write me a lesson plan with these learning outcomes. It needs to be, you know, 30 minutes long um, and should have two activities. It can actually generate something like that. It can generate uh, policies. Um, it can actually, one of the policies that I actually had it uh, try to make was a policy on academic honesty. And so it will include uh, text about AI in general too when you ask it to do that. Um, it can create rubrics, worksheets, multiple choice questions. So it can really speed up the process of um, writing in general. A lot of people are talking about um, chat GPT and open uh, and um, AI software as speeding up the writing process. So that's one of the benefits of it. 
Um, it can also make lists of ideas, for instance. You can say, give me a, uh, well, yesterday was Valentine's Day, give me a list of um, uh, activities I can do for Valentine's Day for, you know, my significant other, and it can come up with a list. And if you don't like the list, you can say, give me more ideas, and it will give you more ideas, um, that kind of thing. So it can come up with a list of ideas. So it can be useful as a um, brainstorming tool. It can also format things with bullet points, tables, um, HTML, things of that nature. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, one of the major things that is uh, thought to be a disruptor in industry is that it's very good at coding. It's actually one of the things it's better at doing. So um, it can uh, put things into code. For instance, you can say, I would like you uh, to write something in JavaScript that can do X, Y, or Z, and it can come up with that for you. You can also put in code that you've developed and say it's not working, what's wrong with this, and it can fix the problem for you. And it's really good at remembering previous conversations. So what can happen is you can sit there and go back and forth about a piece of code or a piece of text and continuously improvement and make changes on it. So it can do syntax and programming languages, um, algorithms and status structures. So it can help with like um, providing suggestions on how to optimize data structures. Um, uh, let's see what else. <clears throat> it can do um, best practices. So it can kind of even teach someone how to code in general. Uh, there's also other programs uh, that are similar to GPT in that they are artificial intelligence but they can work with images and videos as well. So I'm not gonna cover those as in depth, but we have the same type of thing that can happen where you can ask a, um, an AI software, I would like an image of someone you know, walking through a forest and it's cloudy and um, you know, there's elves on the sideline and it can generate an image based on previous images. It's the same kind of thought idea for images as for text. It's got a big database. It can pull it together in a way uh, that makes sense. So that's kind of what AI can do. Now, let me give you some examples. Um, so one of the things I've asked it to do is uh, make a graph about AI use um, with a title, access legends, and labels. So I just gave it something to do. And it did uh, point out that pie charts do not have axes. So it was <laughs> smart enough to figure out that. And it kind of explained um, what it would look like. I don't know where this data came from. I don't know if it's based on anything. That's one of the things we'll talk about. Uh, but it was able to explain a pie chart. And then I asked it, for instance, um, can you put that pie chart in HTML? So I could put it on a website, for instance. Uh, and I didn't put all of the uh, code in here, but you can see it did include the code. And then at the end, it even gave um, explanation about how you could change the code to uh, customize it. So it can do stuff like that. So while uh, some chatbots like ChatGPT can't do visuals per se in the same way, it can create the ability to put the visuals in another medium, for instance, a web page or something like that. Um, so something else that I asked it to do is write a limerick about AI. <laughs> so um, it can write about itself and is uh, very self-reflective. It can also do other types of poetry. Um, it can generate, so it, it can be, I, I don't know if I want to say creative in a way, but it can generate new combinations. So generate three characters for a book about space travel, um, I need names and brief descriptions of their personalities, right? So this is what it came up with. And um, it's very polite. At the end, you can even see, like, it lets me say you can modify them if you want. So it's uh, very uh, polite as well in interacting with humans. So these are kind of some of the very basics of what it can do. So now let's talk about what it cannot do or its accuracy and limitations. Um, so it's wrong a lot and it's very confident in its wrongness. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's confident that it's right even though it's wrong, if that makes sense. So um, it will with every confidence spit out a correct answer 
and an incorrect answer with the same level of uh, confidence. It can't tell when it's wrong. And it's very often wrong. Um, be that because it's limited in its database of how much information it has currently, or it's um, just making things up because it will, uh, it's not very frequent that it will say, I don't have that information. It will, it's based on probability, right? Of like, these phrases seem to be used a lot. So it puts them together. Um, it will, literally make up sources and citations. So um, let me skip forward and I'll show you an example um, here. So what are three good sources for reading about psychology and apples, right? So I just picked one of them and I decided like, okay, there's a book on the psychology of eating apples. That's very interesting. So I picked it out, put it in Google search. That book doesn't exist. So it literally just made up sources, right? And so these are the kind of things that we need to be aware of is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't act as an actual research library itself. It will just make up sources and citations um, and put things together. So um, one of the things I will say is that the quality of the prompt that you provide will change the quality of the answer you get. So the more simple your prompts are, the more likely it is that you will have very surface level um, explanations from the program. Um, the more detailed you can make your prompt, the more detailed uh, the response can be. Um, but it is just like Googling can be a skill, right? There are gonna be, or um, you know, searching li library databases for books and articles is a skill that needs to be taught to students. Um, these kind of um, how you develop prompts and how you use prompts is a skill that will result in better or worse um, uh, responses from the program. So one of the big concerns is uh, the limitations uh, based on its accuracy that we have for these kinds of programs as of now. Um, because the information that it puts out is only as good as its algorithms and the databases it was trained on. And we don't know exactly what those are. Um, so that's something to be aware of. So let me skip forward just a minute here, since we already did that. Um, here are some other considerations you might want to think about, um, especially from if you're an educator, if you're just a professional, but these are things to think about. How do you cite this program? So um, the terms and conditions of, for instance, ChatGPT has changed how they want you or don't want you to cite the program. Um, a lot of citations and academic honesty policies talk about stealing other people's ideas, but here we're dealing with a program's generation uh, of text, right? So that's something that um, universities and professors and professionals are going to have to think about is how do you cite that the text you got was from the program? And where is the line of the, um, for instance, if you're asking it to change the tone or style of your essay, is it still your essay? Th these are things to consider. But and I'm not saying it's not your essay anymore, so don't get me wrong, but these are things to think about. And uh, I would say that programs like ChatGPT actually aren't that far off from programs like Grammarly or um, uh, you know, some of the, it's like the next step, I would almost say, uh, sometimes when you're using it as a way to get feedback on your work uh, compared to like autocorrect and things like that. So this is kind of like the next step up. Um, other things to consider when using or want to using this in your classes is um, the control of data that is supplied to the program. So do remember if you're entering in prompts, if you're entering essays or texts, um, that kind of becomes the property of the company. <laughs> I mean, you're, you are agreeing when you agree to their terms and conditions that they are going to use it to improve their own program or what else. So um, this hasn't come through the legal system yet of how this will be controlled, right? But 
um, be careful about what you put in because um, they can use this for um, improving their program. They can use it to, um, I mean, there's going to be a database on the other end of everything that has been entered into programs like this. So keep that in consideration if you are sharing personal information, if you are sharing, um, you know, uh, research that's very important to you and that you don't want out there in the larger world, right? Uh, something else that people are starting to think about is misuse of these programs. So that's everything from, uh, you know, plagiarism to claiming that you've written something that the program has actually written. Um, it's also, um, these programs are self-training. So they're learning what is coming in from their own programs. So um, they're just like with Wikipedia and other things, uh, there could be teams of people that decide that they want to convince the AI of uh, facts or uh, train it for other things that um, would be considered misuse. And so those are things that we need to consider as well. Um, there's also bias. So um, like I said before, the information that the program puts out is only as the good as the information that goes into it. And we don't know what the quality of the information that goes into it is. So, but I do know, and we all know how um, the internet can, and especially social media and things like that can contain a lot of bias. Um, so for instance, if you ask one of the AI image um, uh, generators to generate uh, four images of faculty teaching in a class, you're most likely gonna get um, white men they're going to be shown because those are the, it's a lot of it is based off statistics, right? Because that's the most common image that is um, associated with those things. So those are things to look out for as you are using or thinking about using these programs. All right, so next up is AI and education. Um, so one of the, th the most important points I hope you walk away from with this uh, webinar, besides just the basics of AI, is that we can design assignments and assessments so that there is no need for detection software. Um, I see in a lot of places people are talking about um, kind of this arms race of like um, Turnitin and GPT-0 and things like that that can detect when uh, AI chatbots have been used to generate text. And um, I, if we actually design our assignments and our assessments in classrooms in a way that um, either integrates or um, makes it very difficult to use AI, we won't have to worry as much about trying to detect it. And I think that's actually the better way to go because you can, if you have really great assignments and assessments, you're gonna have better uh, learning uh, that's happening with your students in the first place. And so this is really difficult to hone in, but I think it's really worth uh, reconsidering your assignments and assessments in a way that um, really increases the amount of critical thinking that's required. It's not just regurgitation of facts and figures, although that can be important at some times. Um, I think the higher level um, assignments and assessments are really going to be critical to as we move forward um, because AI is a tool that is going to be used in businesses all over the place. It's going to be used in different fields. Um, and this is the new reality that we're kind of looking at. Um, the other consideration or the other uh, main point about this is that we do have a responsibility to our students to teach about these AI tools. Um, and what I mean by that is, is really that this is the future. AI chatbots are, and image bots are here to stay, right? They are already being used in many fields and professions. Um, and it is our responsibility as educators to teach students about these tools, how they're going to be used in their fields and professionals. And um, we also need to teach them basically the, liter uh, the information literacy of using these programs, it's going to be very important. So um, how and when to use AI tools, 
um, is going to be very important to teach our students. And that will mean that we have to learn as well, right? Um, but if they are going to go out into the world um, professionally or otherwise, they need to know about how, when, and why to use these tools. So um, integrating this into assignments, um, these are some of the skills that I think will be really important for uh, future uh, professions and fields is how to use AI chatbots and image bots, when to use them, how they work. And I don't just mean um, how to, you know, pull them up on your computer and put in a prompt. I mean, like, how do these things work so that they understand um, what the strengths and weaknesses of the programs are um, so they can think about legal considerations, things like that. This is uh, going to be, as these programs continue to grow and change, this is going to be something that uh, we need to really understand and our students need to understand. So um, I'm going to give you a few examples of how to integrate this into your assignments, and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A because I do want to leave time for that because I know that there's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of discussion based on this. So, um, oh, went too far. Let me go back. Um, improve the AI response. Um, so run uh, your version of the prompt through ChatGPT or the equivalent. Analyze what it offers and what it's missing and include the responses attachment. So this is how you can have your students interact with the AI um, in a way that gets them practiced at making prompts, um, but also responding to its limitations, right? So if you want your students to write a simple essay on the psychology, uh, on psychology and apples, have them um, run either a standard response or come up with their own response about the topic, put it through ChatGPT, and then have them include the response and then respond to the response with um, what is missing from the AI. And you can have them do one round of prompt or multiple rounds of prompts. And uh, I think that will get students thinking about um, the limits of the AI. Um, another way you can do it is um, uh, have it more as a writing prompt. So have um, your essay topic uh, run as a prompt. So basically say, I would like an outline uh, on this topic and then have the students use that outline to create their own essays. Um, and you could take it a step further but then having the students write why the outline, uh, what the strengths and weaknesses of that outline were. So especially if you are teaching uh, writing, this could be an interesting way to really get students thinking again about the strengths and weaknesses of AI, but also giving them uh, a launching point. I think, you know, uh, outline creation and uh, using AI this way are really going to become uh, much more common moving forward. Um, another really strong way to use AI is feedback for writing. Um, and so some people will be very happy about this feature and some won't just because um, it does, uh, you don't want uh, your students to rely on a tool too much, right? You want them to have their own, uh, develop their own skills. But how you can do this is, um, is treated kind of like uh, another version of Grammarly, right? So you can have the students enter their essay and ask for feedback on their writing or have the program generate their, um, regenerate their essay in a different writing style. Then have the student actually analyze the feedback. So not just have the student say, okay, here's the feedback, I'm putting it into my essay, but have them analyze the feedback. Why did the AI decide, uh, make those suggestions? Um, and the, Or you could have them say, if it changes the writing style, say, you know, what was it that changed the writing style here? Like what specific changes were made and why did that change the writing style? So you can use it as a way to teach the skills in general. Um, and I think this will be very useful, especially to um, anyone that teaches writing, which is <laughs> most fields, we all want them to write in a professional voice of whatever field we're in, right? So 
this is something uh, that I think could be quite useful. And always uh, have the response as an attachment if you, especially if you're worried about, um, you know, some kind of issues with plagiarism, things like that. All right, uh, so this is not my idea, but this is um, an idea by uh, Sandra that, and I will share in the resources where I got this from. Um, this is uh, how to talk about AI ethics in your classroom. So have them read and annotate the terms of service um, in the AI technology, and then have a discussion on it. You know, what is the impact on labor, climate, education, personal data, privacy? Um, and then uh, they, she suggests also like, why not have a symposium showcasing their findings to the wider campus community? That could be very interesting and really get students engaged in what this means um, for them in their professional lives and for, um, you know, the world in general. So I think that's a, a great assignment. Um, so this one is more about uh, developing crit uh, critical thinking using ChatGPT as a kind of a jumping off. So, you know, write 200 uh, words in response to a prompt, you know, what do you consider the, to be the limitations of ChatGPT? Um, so, you know, they can get together and discuss their pieces and stuff like that. Um, and so I, I think this is just kind of a great discussion piece. Um, next, um, branching scenarios. Um, so you can also have ChatGPT help you as an instructor with uh, your course design. Um, so for instance, uh, case studies are really time consuming to develop. Um, but you can use the AI to develop some of these case studies, um, but not only develop the case studies themselves, you could have the AI, you know, develop branching options and things like that um, so that um, you can give these scenarios to your students. Um, one example uh, that I think this could be great, especially at CGU, is uh, um, SCGH students or SCGH courses. Um, really giving some hands-on practice, for instance, with case studies. Um, so those are several of the dis, um, examples of how to use AI in your classes. I will say um, I think it has great potential to, um, you know, help with lesson plans, um, things like that. Um, but it is very general and based on your prompt. So for instance, um, for this webinar, I went into ChatGPT and I said, write a script for a webinar about AI and education. Uh, it needs to be one hour long and uh, it should include these objectives, right? And it did give me a script. It was very basic though. So um, I would have to get very particular about the prompt I was putting in. Uh, to get a better output than that. So I really think that the future is going to be um, based on the skills that students need to do good prompts. Um, we need to talk about um, the shortcomings and strengths of these programs, and we really need to pass on information literacy to our students. And this might mean we're learning with them, right? But I think that's a great place to be and makes students feel more empowered, honestly. So moving forward, um, discussions. So we're going to have uh, Q&A in just a second. But moving forward, I would really encourage you to discuss ChatGPT uh, and AI bots with your peers. See what they're doing in their classes. Um, see how they are thinking about it. And uh, try out these AI programs yourself. There are a ton of free ones out there. Um, and they can really be used in exciting ways in your courses and in the fields that we're preparing students to go into. Um, talk to your students, have open conversations with your students about uh, the program and what's appropriate use in your classes and also what's appropriate use outside your classes. So just have discussions about this with your students. I know a lot of students still don't even know it exists. Um, so this is a tool that they're gonna be need to know about and I think it's important that we educate them about its existence and also how to use it. Finally, I would really encourage you to go to more trainings and webinars 
Um, this is one over the basics and applied how it applies to education, but there are a lot more going on out there about how to, I've seen webinars on how to incorporate AI chatbots to increase admissions in uh, higher education or how to help um, online stores generate revenue, things like that. So uh, if you are interested in any particular thing, I'd really encourage you to sign up for that um, and go to more trainings. Um, all right. So I wanted to open it up for Q&A. And just before uh, I do that, as you are thinking about your questions and we're talking about discussion, um, do visit our website if you are looking for resources, if you're a faculty member or a student uh, and we have more events coming up, our website is right there. We will also be posting these slides and the recording online for anyone to uh, view later. So uh, keep that in mind. Now, I wanted to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or um, ask out loud. No one has any questions about, okay. I'm curious if others have already started these discussions in their classrooms. Yes, um, so one of the things I know that uh, CAFE and uh, Preparing Future Faculty here at CGU have already started having uh, discussions with our graduate students about how they can incorporate them into their classes. Um, and I am hearing from some, especially community college professors um, who have talked to their students about it. Most of those conversations seem to be about the ethics of the program and less about how in particular to use them, but more about academic honesty and how it pertains to academic honesty. But I really wanna encourage people to take that next step beyond academic honesty and uh, talk about how to use it, how to improve students' writing, how to incorporate it into um, you know, their careers. And moving forward, it's, it's going to be the reality. Yeah. Um, how's it been going? So yeah, um, the, the discussion students, uh, some of them have heard about it, some of them haven't. Um, some of them uh, are excited to use it and others are um, the students. The students are nervous um, that they don't want to commit academic um, uh, dishonesty or plagiarism and so are kind of scared of the tool. Um, Yes, I, and if anyone has any um, uh, experience that they'd like to share in their own classroom, we would be um, interested in hearing about that as well. There is a question in the chat, Shelby. Are professionals encouraging students to use ChatGPT to form the basis of their submissions? So um, right now, some professors, uh, there are, <laughs> excuse me, there's always a, um, a spread, right? A range of responses that professors are, are, are using. And I would say some professors are encouraging the use of chat GPT in students writing. So not necessarily asking them to use it as a base uh, to then form their essays off of it, um, but they do, they are using it as some of the examples that I mentioned, where they're asking their students to come up with a base essay and then analyzing that base essay. So they're not asking them to use it as um, basically their responses to the class, but they are using it in a way that makes a higher level of learning for the students as far as analysis of text and writing in that way. Um, they're, they have been using it for brainstorming. Uh, topics or um, uh, search suggestions, things like that. So they are having people use it, um, but they are very intentional about how they were, are having people use it. And I see someone with their hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I know like we we're talking about who um, have experience of using chat GPT in their class. So um, I am a second year 
a student in CGU and I'm a major in financial engineering. So for this semester, I'm taking on a class called um, Advanced Big Data uh, Analysis. From the very from the very first lecture of this class, we already get introduced to ChatGPT. And actually, I think for the rest of the semesters, because the class is really small, and um, uh, my professor actually required us to use ChatGPT for the coding part to um, do the uh, to do projects for this semesters. So, um, I. I Personally, I'm feeling like it, it really, especially for um, engineering people, it really depends on which track you're gonna go on in the future. If you uh, decided to go to um, industrial, like you want to have a career working for the companies, ChatGPT can be, um, how to say that, uh, can be a quite good competitor because you know the most of the time we do is coding, especially when we want to get an entry level job. A lot of companies already have the intention to use to integrate Jet GPT in their, you know, management or running process to replace those people. And the um the only way for us to you know get the job successfully is uh, basically trying to learn how it works and trying to figure out if if we can become a supporting part. For that systems because that's the um that's what I'm thinking, but if if the engineering people decided to go uh, academic in the future, for example, teaching in the school or doing research, I think ChatGPT can be a very quite useful tools for us to use, and it's kind kind of like you know like contributing to your career in the future. So it's it really depends on the situation. Absolutely. That's a great point. So um, especially when it comes to coding, um, this ChatGBT is a really excellent, excellent tool. And um, it's going to be one way that people can learn to code. Um, it, it is, they are talking about it taking the place of some lower level coding positions. Um, but on the other hand, um, especially for those lower levels, but some of uh, the company's responses have been quite interesting as far as whether their employees can use this program or not. So some of the companies are concerned about um, the data sharing. So for instance, you could potentially, so the ChatGPT OpenAI company could potentially mine the inputs of Amazon employees, for instance, to figure out what Amazon is working on and get a jump uh, and so, you know, sell that data to, for instance, a competitor, right? And so there are a lot of companies that are not allowing their employees to actually use the program. And um, the other thing is that, so it's been mixed by companies, right? We're going to see um, uh, intellectual property issues developing here as well. But, but yes, I think you're right, especially for an industry, we're going to see this be a tool that's used all the time. I think this is the next generation of essentially a calculator, I guess, right? You know, this is kind of what we're looking at. Um, I see I have quite a few things in the chat. So let me. Um, Professor Freund had her hand up, um, but she prompted in the chat that she's concerned that we do not know how much how grad students learn. If we ask them to use AI to write something, is that really a good idea? If AI gives them something, do they learn enough to do it themselves going forward? So that's a great question. And so that's why I would suggest when you bring it in, I do think you need to bring it into your classrooms. But what we need to do is not just have it, you know, write or give feedback to the students, but we need to take it to the next level of learning where we ask the students to then analyze what the AI has done so that they can use it as uh, it becomes part of their skill set. So Basically, you would have them, for instance, put in, you know, a text, the AI gives them feedback, then we want them to analyze that feedback to identify their uh, weaknesses in their own writing, for instance, or um, why the AI is making those suggestions. And that's really a metacognition that the students are then engaging in rather than just writing. And I would actually suggest that it would improve their writing faster than just simply having them write. So I do I think it's very creative. Be, what was that, Sarah? 
I think it's very creative to challenge AI. So you were saying that it's a le next level cognitive thing. So if we can think about it in, in ways that you're actually learning more on the hierarchy of, of, of learning by, 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 cha by, by challenging that, don't you think mm -hmm. so? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. We're wanting to do that higher level learning. And I do think that that um, using the AI in that way will help. Now, if you're just asking them to do a simple essay, putting it in AI and telling them that like, it will help them with their grammar, I don't think that that's going to help their learning as much. Um, you know, I think that, um, but I think that next layer of analysis will help them. And then, you know, if they do that next layer of analysis, and then you come on top of that and give them feedback on their analysis, they're going to have, yeah, like Sarah said, a much higher level of learning. Um, another There's, question was yeah. how accurate is chatbot translating text uh, into code and languages? Um, so I do think this is where I'm not sure about the language. I haven't done much testing of the language or heard much about that. But from what I understand, it's pretty accurate, especially coding. It is very accurate um, because, I mean, it's um, especially coding is such a, I don't want to say straightforward, but I mean, it is. It's like a straightforward process, right? It would make sense that the computer understands coding more than even uh, English, for instance. So it is quite accurate for that. Um. There is another piece of, of comment uh, um, in regards of ChatGPT, and I liked it so much. It's by Stephanie. Um, I see ChatGPT as the new calculator of writing. Mm -hmm. And like the calculator, it's a tool. You have to know how to use it or the theory behind the equations you're inserting into the calculator. I feel like it's the same with ChatGPT. It's a tool, but we need to know how to use it and know the theory in order to understand the material in the first place. Especially since ChatGPT is simple, somewhat limited, students should understand those limitations so they can expand and learn through the process. I 100% agree with you, Stephanie. That is, yes, I feel the exact same way. It is a tool. It is a tool that is going to continue to move with us into the future and only get better. And I think one of the responsibilities we have as educators is to understand that tool and um, teach our students the literacy required of when, where, how to use it. And I, I think that's going to be really important for their futures and for the future of education. Yeah, um, we should treat it as the tool, same way we use Google, right? You know, this isn't I, I really, you know, remember when educators really freaked out about um, Wikipedia and we did the same thing with students. We talked about Wikipedia with students. We said, you know, it's uh, appropriate as a jumping off space, but you're not going to be like quoting Wikipedia because we don't even, like anybody can go in and edit those pages. And so we taught them the literacy behind Wikipedia. If you're looking for basic information and a jumping off point to go look at other um, you know, resources, it's great in that way. And it has been great for um, information for across the world, right? Um, but we need to understand what the limits are, what the how accurate it is, and how to best use it. Absolutely. Um, yes, great. Um, all right, any other questions or comments or experiences you've had while using it yourself? Um, Hamida Suedi, he said, uh, is it a tool or a method of learning? And we addressed that. But I wanted to, to say it out there that it can be a method of learning. If you critically appraise what chat GPT is giving you back, you will learn along the way. So basically, if you ask, you prompt it to write it in a pessimistic tone, for example, and you go back and read it very well and identify those aspects that make a paragraph pessimistic, that's a learning tool. If yeah. you ask it to make a template, you learn how templates are made. Uh, I mean, like templates of an email, a professional email, uh, a template of a proposal, a templates of, of uh, 
even how an introduction is written. And you learn that, like you, you, you take it and you learn it. That's a learning tool. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, something I do want to mention, too, someone brought up Google is um, there is tension right now between uh, entities like Google and uh, these AI chatbots, right? Um, one of the things that uh, Google is doing is deprioritizing content that they think was made by an AI. Um, and part of that, the reason is they are concerned about accuracy, um, but they also wanna distinguish themselves from AI. Um, we have other companies like, I think it's Microsoft, that's wanting to incorporate AI into its search engines, like I think it's Bing. Um, and so we see companies responding to this very differently. And so we're really on the edge of, I always go back to a potential paradigm shift about how technology is going to be used moving forward. And so I think it's one of the things that's going to be most important going forward is how accurate, for instance, a program is. So if you're using something like AI for facts and information about the world in general, I think you're gonna be disappointed on how accurate it is. If you're using it as a learning tool to improve your own writing, I think that is an excellent way to use it, one of its main strengths. If you're using it to learn how to code, for instance, that's great. If you're using it as a you know, information gathering system, I think that that's really gonna be a weakness of it. Um, <laughs> anything that can help Bing would be welcomed. Yeah, Bing's not doing great. <laughs> um, let's see. So well, I think that how we're approaching it. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. Now there is a Bing AI. Oh, Bing AI, yeah. So basically, yeah, it will help it. And now there's a waiting list. So I think we should run and <laughs> and and for the first time say it, go to Bing. Run to Bing. <laughs> Uh, there is a comment by by uh, Humaid as well that um, if we use it as Google, we dismiss the intelligence part. And I want to say it out there that we want to teach our students that it's not that intelligent. We shouldn't rely on it because we don't know. And you have said it in the in the webinar. We don't know the resources. And it's uh, what did you say? You said that it was um, very confident in its wrongness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't want to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and again, I one of the things I would just reiterate too is the intellectual property issues. And don't put anything into Chat GPT that you're not wanting to become public knowledge, because we don't know how that data is secured yet. Um, and um, we don't know how this program was trained. You know, and so one of the things that we're going to have to watch out for with AI technology is just like we do on the Internet, are the sources biased that it's producing, things like that. That's why I would really encourage ChatGPT, use it as, you know, a language helping software, a coding helping software, but not as an information gathering tool. In the future, that might change, um, but as of right now, um, yeah, it is really confident in its wrong answers and you can't tell when it's right or not. So um, you can use it as a brainstorming tool, but um, I, I really think the strengths also come from its creativeness, uh, potentially helping writers come up with stories or things like that. So um, really think about how you're wanting to use it and what ways you're wanting to use it and get your students thinking about this too. Um, it, it's really bringing up some interesting questions about ethics and uh, information literacy and things like that, and, and the future of technology, really. Um, all right, any, we have about five minutes left. Oh, okay, will it be replacing us as humans thinking? Uh, so I have heard this question before, and I think absolutely not, um, because it the information that it generates is based on what is put in, right? And so it's scouring the internet for, um, basically it's learning from us, I guess, um, what the next probable um, phrase should be from any uh, prompt that's coming into it. So basically it, I don't see it replacing us. Um, it, is, <laughs> it is getting, um, 
it will get more information, but you know, people have to be, let me talk a little bit more about the database. The database has to be very controlled in what goes into it and what doesn't. So for instance, there was, um, I do know that they had, they hired a ton of people to go through the database um, that it had like all the internet data that it was going to put into the AI and scrub a lot of it away because it wasn't appropriate, right? And so we see humans having a heavy hand in what information is going into these AIs because it determines so much what comes out. There's so many filters that need to be in place so that it can be available to the public. And I really think that just like any new tool, um, it is going to make changes in the workplace, but it won't replace people. It will just mean people need to be doing uh, other things. So, for instance, when um, you know we had um, we moved from typewriters to computers, for instance, we didn't need as many people doing typewriting, but we needed more people that can use could use computers. So it's really just advancing. Um, or changing um, what things are going to be needed in the workplace.